Well, good evening, and let me add my welcome to uh, Biff's, and Biff, once again, that was uh, amazing. Uh, I was just thinking I want to dedicate that first song, Ain't No Sunshine When You're Gone, to my lovely wife, Joy, because if, when she's not around, that's exactly how I feel. So, Joy, that one's for you. And uh, uh, that train of coming, I just uh, want to encourage everybody that's watching tonight, and over the next few weeks, you're going to see how important it is. Get on the train, and uh, your ticket is Jesus, and when you ask him into your life, uh, everything changes. So, uh, and again, we're on session 25 tonight. Session 26 will be two weeks from tonight. Next week, again, as Biff said, will be a special Ash Wednesday uh, service. Ash Wednesday is the beginning of the Lenten season leading up to Easter, and so uh, we're going to observe that here, live stream. Uh, and then we'll be back. So, um, again, uh, tonight we have a real, uh, gosh, I don't know how to even uh, introduce it. We have a hotly debated subject that we're going to be uh, looking at tonight. Uh, again, tonight, uh, part of what will happen as I'm teaching tonight is I am going to use some graphics. And I thought I would, again, give you my email address uh, if you would like me to email you those graphics, email me and let me know. You'll also be able, uh, once we get through them, you'll also understand how you could go up online and, and download them also. But tonight, again, uh, we're, we're looking at a subject called the millennium. And uh, of all of the issues in the book of Revelation that uh, really are, you know, not only difficult to understand, but have had a variety of interpretations. Uh, the millennium is one of the hottest. So uh, tonight we're going to be in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. And I'm going to try and do three things tonight. One is I'm simply going to uh, try and explain what the millennium uh, is. And uh, secondly, uh, I'm going to walk you through some of the major views of the millennium. And then third, I, I want to try and... Uh, show you from the perspective I come at it uh, from what, go, what might go on during the millennium. So what is the millennium? Let me just uh, take you to a couple of texts. Uh, in Revelation chapter 20, the chapter begins this way. I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. It, let, let me comment real quickly because I'm not going to go back to this, but, but really all four of the identifying names of the evil one are, are listed here. He's the dragon, he's the serpent from the garden, uh, he's the devil, and he is Satan. So he's bound for a thousand years, we're told. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Uh, the text, let me just simply say that if you just read the text, and let's say uh, you throw out the fact that we know the book is symbolic, but we also know that there are pieces of it that seem to be more literal. So if you kind of throw out the symbolic piece, uh, what the millennium is, because the word doesn't actually appear in the text, is a thousand year period of time according to this chapter, in which Jesus Christ will reign as king on this present planet, and Satan will be bound, uh, keeping him from fighting against the purposes of God. Now, the context of this, let me real briefly remind you a bit, and again, uh, coming at it from more of a futurist perspective, Remember these things, the, uh, the Battle of Armageddon is over, 
Uh, the armies of the world have invaded the Middle East and there's been just massive slaughter. Uh, it would appear that Antichrist and his forces and the survivors of that then surround Jerusalem. And in my mind, perhaps when humanity is just about to destroy itself, Jesus Christ returns. Chapter 19, verse 11. By the way, again, because of the symbolism uh, of the book of Revelation, I would say that, you know, probably uh, it's not going to look exactly like the way that chapter 19 portrays it, because it portrays him coming on a white horse and the armies of heaven behind him. We, we aren't exactly sure what it's going to look like, but what we do know is he returns. And when he returns, Antichrist and his armies are destroyed, and the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. We're, we're going to look at the lake of fire in two weeks and go into a little more detail on that. Also, Babylon is destroyed, and again, uh, it, we're either talking about a, a city at the end of uh, this age that is a literal city that gets destroyed, sort of the Rome of our day, or what you might think of as the beast's city, or uh, if more symbolically, it's the end of what we would think of as the world system that for since the time of the fall, has been in conflict with the purposes of God and, and has seduced people with cravings for the sensual and cravings for wealth and material things and, and craving for power and prestige, all keeping people away from a relationship with God through Christ. And again, these things kind of all mix together chronologically in these later chapters, and we've approached a certain way, but our, our chronology might not be 100% accurate. But after all of that context, then comes chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. And again, we're going to look at this thousand year period and the big question, uh, as it has been throughout the book of Revelation, are we speaking about a literal thousand years or is this symbolic of something else? And uh, really, uh, all of the views uh, have some problems with them. I'm going to take you through the three primary views about the millennium. We went through some of this uh, in session 10. I'm going to expand on that a, a, a bit. And I, just so many books have been written about this that again, it, it can be very confusing. So we're, we're going to just take a brief look again at the three major positions. Uh, the first major position, or the first millennial view, is what's called post-millennialism. Now, the big reason it's called that is if you, if, if, you look at the, if you look at the chart, what you will see over under number seven there is that Christ returns at the end of the millennium under this view of these thousand years. Postmillennialism uh, believes that those thousand years spoken of here in chapter 20 are not literal. They're symbolic. And they are symbolic of the church age. And actually, when you look at the chart, if you go back just underneath the cross, you'll see that in this system, they believe that Satan was bound uh, after the victory of Christ on the cross, and that the thousand years that are mentioned here in the book are what you would think of as the church age, and under post-millennialism, and this is what is uh, its primary distinction, that kind of the wavy line that uh, is uh, ascending there on the graph, uh, the post-millennialists believed that this would be a golden age of church success and, and that the church uh, would be effective in uh, not only evangelizing the world, but in transforming culture 
and that because the church was successful uh, during the church age in accomplishing that, then at the end of that age, Jesus Christ will return. So it's post. He comes at the end of the millennium. Predominantly, this was a... Uh, a theory about the millennium that was held during the 18th and 19th centuries. It seemed to be a time where even in philosophy, uh, there was sort of an optimistic humanism, you know, that everything was getting better. And again, you can kind of see how uh, in terms of the church, there would, might be this idea that, hey, we're, we're actually going to accomplish the evangelization of the world and, and uh, we're going to end up with a, a world in which Christ really reigns and then he's going to return. Um, I, I have to say that uh, World War I pretty much destroyed this particular view of the millennium and then of course closely followed by world war ii it was obvious that humanity was not getting better and this view tended to kind of die out a bit uh, it is interesting that in uh, in modern times there's sort of a a new form of that. Uh, it's usually referred to as Christian Reconstructionism. And uh, it's the idea that, again, that, uh, that the church is going to win the culture wars and that we are going to effectively evangelize the world. The world is going to turn uh, to Christ. And so that's kind of almost a, uh, a modern post-millennialism. But again, it was a position, uh, again, that was not uh, historically held, uh, was held for a short period of time. And, and although there are some scholars that would still hold to that today, a very small number. So that's the, really the first view of the millennium. The second view of the millennium uh, is called amillennialism, and you can kind of tell uh, from the word itself, it, it, it means there is no literal uh, millennium. So again, the thousand years are viewed symbolic, uh, not as literal. And again, something a little like postmillennialism, uh, they're viewed as actually uh, representing what they would call the, the church age. And under this particular position, we would be in the millennium right now. Um, probably uh, what's different in post-millennialism, it's not exactly an optimistic view of the church age. Uh, it does believe also, like post-millennialism, that, uh, that Satan was bound at the cross. And, you know, when I process that, particular piece of these two, two views, I think of other scripture that talk about how the fact that right now, um, you know, we're engaged in a spiritual warfare and that Satan is active. You know, Peter said he, you know, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And uh, Paul over in Ephesians chapter 6 says that our, our battle isn't against flesh and blood, but against principalities and, and powers. And so, you know, the idea that somehow Satan has already been bound during the church age, I, I, really, I really struggle with that. But it does have kind of this particular view, sort of a pessimistic view of the end times, uh, like the book of Revelation. And uh, the, in amillennialism, uh, the tribulation period at the end of the age would be followed by the return of Jesus Christ. And, but immediately in amillennialism, uh, Jesus would establish the new age right then there wouldn't be this thousand year period of time because again that's been symbolic of what has come before this was a view um, that really was kind of popularized uh, during the time of augustine he became really the sort of the uh, the leading theologian 
not only of his time, but in a sense in the Catholic Church, uh, which was the only church there was at the time, um, you know, his theology uh, defined Catholicism uh, almost all the way to the time of the Reformation. So for a bulk of church history, uh, this was the predominant view of the millennium, that it, it represented uh, the church age and that at the end of the church age Christ would come and immediately we would enter into uh, the new age that the book of Revelation talks about. So, so amillennialism. And, and I should say this, there are, um, there are some really smart guys that hold this position. Uh, there are some great theologians that have held this position. Uh, many true believers hold this position. This doesn't mean that you uh, are a heretic or that, you know, that you're not a Christian. It simply means that a as you understand the Scripture, and two big things uh, that led to the view, number one was simply, again, the symbolic nature of the rest of the book, and secondly, the fact that this is the only place in the book of Revelation or the New Testament uh, that talk about specifically a thousand-year period of time. I, I hope to show you tonight that there are some other texts that I think that sort of fit into a more literal understanding, but uh, because of that fact that this is the only place that it's mentioned, although it's mentioned six times, by the way, in those short verses, uh, again, that, uh, that, that, that the it's not a literal uh, millennium. The third view, and my hunch is that many of you watching, uh, myself included, tend to uh, hold this view uh, of, of this uh, period of time. It's called pre-millennialism. And the pre there uh, is there because... Premillennialism believes that Jesus Christ, it's the actual return of Jesus Christ that then initiates a literal thousand year period. And uh, that thousand years could be symbolic of just a, a massive amount of time or it could be very exact, but that Christ initiates the millennium and he rules and reigns with his followers during this period of time. At the end of this period of time, as we'll see today, there's a brief uh, release of Satan who has been bound at the beginning of this period. Um, so Satan's been active throughout the church age and premillennialism, but he gets bound at the beginning of the millennium. And at the end, he's loosed for kind of one uh, final uh, rebellion against God, and we'll see the purpose of that a as we move on. Uh, this view, and again, a as I've sort of wrestled through these things myself, uh, this view would hold that, there, that there's a chronology here, that chapters 19 and 20 and 21, that, that there is a sense of chronology. And really, uh, what we know is that in the first three centuries of church history, uh, you can go back and it seemed like a, a quite a number of the, uh, the leaders, what would you, we would call the church fathers, um, prior to, again, the time when uh, the Christian church became the official religion of the Roman Empire, that, uh, that many of them really believed that there would be this literal thousand-year period where Christ would reign from Jerusalem. And uh, under this view, uh, again, Satan is bound for a, this thousand-year period of time, and at the end, he's released uh, for one final test, and then he is destroyed. Uh, he is thrown into uh, the lake of fire, which is the way that Revelation views what we might call hell. Um, this is a view, uh, along with the early church, uh, after the Re Reformation, even though 
the major reformers, Calvin, Lutheran, they were amillennialists, but, but at a point in time uh, when the whole Bible school movement began um, and uh, a more evangelical approach uh, to the scriptures started and the futurist view of things of the book of Revelation, the, these groups really tended uh, to to be pre-millennial. And again, uh, that, although I, I understand the other views, um, you know, this tends to be where I come down. Now, if that's true, uh, and we're going to assume now that, uh, that I'm right about this uh, for the next few minutes, uh, what are the characteristics uh, of this period uh, of time? What, what's the purpose of this period of time and I've got sort of a speculative theory about this and I'll unwrap it for you here in a second I think this is a period of time where all of God's original purposes for this planet are fulfilled and I'll give you three areas that I think uh, are going to be fulfilled that haven't yet uh, during this thousand year period of time. The, the first simply is I believe that this is a period of time where God's purposes for this earth itself, the planet, uh, are fulfilled. Interesting text um, over in Romans chapter 8 where Paul writes, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Now this is a, a reference to the second coming of Christ. And then he goes on, he makes this statement. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. What's, part of what's important about this text is it tells us that, that even uh, planet Earth and the physical nature of things were distorted by the fall. Um, you know, things like uh, hurricanes, perhaps, and um, tornadoes, and uh, what we call natural disasters, what some people refer to as acts of God, that, that the earth was not intended to function like that. Uh, and that creation itself is waiting for the fulfillment of God's plans and purposes. And I think that the millennium could serve that purpose. Uh, it actually kind of ties into some of what we see in the Old Testament that appear to be prophecies about the coming of the millennium. So back in the book of Isaiah, uh, for, for instance, and it's a text that many people are somewhat familiar with, uh, Isaiah wrote, the wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. They will, ne they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so again, that during this period of time, uh, God could take nature back to a, a perfect harmony as he intended it at creation, and that his plans and purposes uh, for the earth and the way that the earth itself was intended to be uh, could be fulfilled by this millennial period. Uh, a second reason why I, that I think uh, might be a reason for the millennium is for God's purposes for the nation of Israel to be fulfilled. Now again, um, under some under amillennialism and some other systems uh, would believe that God is just finished with Israel. So that all of the promises in the Old Testament that were given to Israel uh, now are given to the church instead. 
and that basically God is finished with Israel. Well, what if he isn't? And, uh, and what if, for the sake of uh, his glory, he decides to fulfill all of his original purposes for the nation of Israel? Let me give you a couple. Israel was intended to be a light to the world. That was the initial purpose of the nation being created, to be, to be a blessing to the whole world. And so, again, in Isaiah, Isaiah says this, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His paths. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. By the way, if you remember back when we studied Armageddon and we looked at the book of Joel, this phrase was inverted in Joel, and Joel said that plowshares would be beaten into spears and, or into swords and pruning hooks into spears. In other words, the, the implements of peace uh, would be turned into implements of war. And now Isaiah is saying, again, in the last days, that the instruments of war will be turned into the instruments of peace, and a nation will not take up sword against nation, that it'll be a, uh, a time of peace. But, but Israel itself, uh, so Jesus ruling out of Jerusalem and, uh, and a new temple, a millennial temple being built, uh, people that have survived uh, from Armageddon and uh, the judgments that we've seen in Revelation, that, that they will be a light to the world, but pointing them to Christ. And uh, so that purpose could be fulfilled during the millennium. Um, also, uh, it, it could be the time right at the coming of Christ where we're told that a remnant of Jews will actually come to faith in Jesus. So over in Zechariah chapter 12, there's the prophecy, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. So this could be a period of time, again, when a remnant of the, uh, of the Jewish nation recognized that, that they blew it, in a sense, and, and that Jesus was and is the Messiah and, and will come to faith in Him. So that, that could be accomplished during this period of time it could also be a period of time where the original boundaries of the nation of Israel promised to them um, are occupied and fulfilled this has never happened in history so uh, again when you go back to Genesis chapter 15 when God told Abraham uh, the land that he would inherit here's the scope of it on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants, I will give this land from the Wadi of Egypt, which we think is a reference to the Nile, uh, to the great river, the Euphrates. So if you look at that on a map, uh, the original promise to Israel of the land they would occupy would look like this. It would encompass uh, modern-day Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Syria, most of Iraq, and Israel would, would be from uh, all the way from the Nile to the Euphrates. Here's another kind of picture of what that might look like. But remember, Israel is this tiny, tiny little nation right now, and uh, 
uh, and, and the, the scope of what uh, God promised it to be has never been accomplished. Well, the millennium could be a period of time again where those original boundaries uh, that were promised to the nation uh, uh, will be fulfilled. And, and then the temple itself. In, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, debate and controversy. You know, is there going to be another temple? Because there are many references uh, in prophetic passages about the temple. Uh, Jesus talked about that again at the end of time, and Paul said the same thing, that, that, that the man of lawlessness would uh, desecrate uh, the temple in the same way it was desecrated both by uh, Antiochus Epiphanes at the time of the Maccabees and, and during the time of the Romans also. Uh, but in Ezekiel, chapters 40 on, uh, they give the, the dimensions of the land, and actually, they even tell what tribes will occupy what part of the land. But again, you see the scope uh, of the land. But it also talks about a temple. And uh, some you know, people believe maybe there'll be a temple built before the end of time. But this most scholars believe, is a reference to perhaps a, a temple that's built during the millennium because the dimensions of it are, are so much bigger uh, than what we've ever seen before. And so in Ezekiel he says this, When you allot the land as an inheritance, you are to present to the Lord a portion of the land as a sacred district, 25,000 cubits long, 20 thousand cubits wide the entire area will be holy now this isn't the temple this is the land that surrounds the temple that in a sense will be uh, messiah's land and it's massive it's like um, it's like a, a thousand uh, square miles that will be this holy place and within it then a section of 500 cubits square is to be for the sanctuary with 50 cubits around it for open land. And uh, just, you know, doing some of the math and reading some of the commentaries, you know, today if you went to Israel, there's a belief uh, that this is the old temple mount uh, where the temple once stood. There is some controversy about that these days and there are some other uh, possibilities. But for right now, let's just say that the temple of Herod, this is where it stood and the temple that's described in Ezekiel would be bigger than the temple mount and so it's it's a uh, a promise to Israel that has yet to be fulfilled and, and the dimensions would be large uh, my calculation is that the temple itself would be 562,500 square feet and uh, that comes out to be a little over 12 acres. And, and then around it, this zone uh, that really belongs to Messiah. So again, what the millennial could be is this time when God's purposes for national Israel are fulfilled. And uh, then the third reason is simply God's purposes for the church to be fulfilled. And there's some things that were promised to the church that haven't quite happened yet and uh, one of them here in revelation chapter 20 where he says i saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge now uh, it goes on in it goes on in the text in revelation chapter 20 and it talks about the first resurrection uh, this is a debate how many resurrections are there um, in this particular text, it sounds like there are two, but the first resurrection, again, if you're taking a futurist position spoken of here in Revelation, is after the rapture of the church, which in and of itself includes a resurrection. So th there might be three resurrections instead of just the two, but again, if you go back to 1 Thessalonians, remember what Paul wrote. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, that's the second coming, 
will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. That's the believers that have died before the second coming of the Lord. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. This is a resurrection here that's taking place. This is not what's talked about over here in, uh, uh, in Revelation. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. And the promise to the church, of course, is this, that uh, this will occur, but also then that uh, believers are going to rule and reign over the remnant of the nations with Christ. And when you ask when, is, when would that take place, you know, the millennial could be a period of time where that promise uh, is uh, given to, uh, fulfilled to the church. So a lot could go on. There could be a lot of reasons for uh, a literal millennial period. I mean, th some people ask or argue and say, well, what's the use in that? Why not go immediately into the age to come? Well, the age to come is going to be different. And so I kind of like the idea that perhaps this is a period of time in which every promise that has ever been made, whether it's to uh, Israel or about the earth or the church, would be fulfilled during this period of time. It's going to be a strange period if it is literal. Let me just say that. And I'm, I, I said population here. I, I earlier talked about, you know, kind of uh, the makeup of the millennium or characteristics of it. But if what I have just gone through is true and what the text says is more literal, this, and again, speculation a bit, this will be a time where both mortals and immortals will live together on planet Earth. And I know that probably sounds kind of crazy, but, but you got to think about it. There are, are survivors uh, of the tribulation who eventually come to faith, uh, but haven't died. Um, there are Jews that come to faith, uh, again, at the second coming, uh, but haven't died. Uh, there could be parts of nations that didn't follow the beast or mortals who didn't follow the beast and so there could be mortals on the planet during this thousand year period uh, Isaiah talks about this uh, and again another prophecy that has to do with the future and really fits with a millennium uh, never again will there be in it that's earth uh, an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years, the one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child. And so mortals uh, will be alive during this period of time. Uh, and, and then it, it, when they die, I imagine that they might be resurrected at that point in time or transformed at that point in time. But it definitely is a time where there's also immortals. And so again, in chapter 20, we're told, and this is about the, uh, those that didn't take the mark of the beast, uh, those that were beheaded for their faith during the tribulation period, uh, they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And this is called, in Revelation, the first resurrection. So you have immortals uh, that, that are present, and you have mortals that are present. Uh, the, the people from the rapture that could be present, martyrs of the tribulation, uh, perhaps even angelic beings that we've seen so much here in the book of Revelation. It just, if it is literal, it is going to be a wild, wild time. And uh, Revelation goes on and says this, The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him for a thousand years. Now, the next thing that happens, again, is 
it's, a, it's one of those you just wonder what exactly is going on here. Because Satan, remember, at the beginning of the thousand years was bound and he was put into the abyss, which I think back in chapter 9 is where the demonic beings came out of. And uh, the abyss is closed and it's sealed and, and he's bound for a thousand years. And then we're told at the end of a thousand years, Satan will be released from his prison will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So, and again, this sort of fits with the idea of mortals uh, still being present during the millennium, and it's as if, over a thousand year period, uh, they have reproduced and again have, have gone out to populate uh, parts of the earth. And, and there's one last sifting that God does. He allows Satan one last opportunity and uses it uh, to see those that would turn and, and follow Satan, which apparently they do. And then fire comes from heaven, devours them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur or burning fire where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The final act of the millennium, it's like the destruction of Israel evil itself so the antichrist the false prophets uh the false prophet their forces you know destroyed at the battle of armageddon and here at the end of the millennium satan released one final rebellion uh, one final battle uh, maybe the purpose simply being to show that even under utopian uh, conditions fallen people will rebel but christ crushes it and satan is destroyed and cast into the lake of fire there is no more devil and that leads us into the second half of chapter 20 uh, which is pretty wild also and we will look at that uh, what's called the great white throne judgment and we'll look at that two weeks from tonight remember next week ash wednesday Two weeks from tonight, uh, we're back with session 26 of uh, the book of Revelation Explained. Biff, you want to come on up? Thanks again, Dr. Bob. You are an incredible teacher, extraordinaire, and we thank you so much for your wisdom and for your scholarship and uh, unpacking the book of Revelation and um, I, thank you. I've really struggled with some of those passages tonight in the past. And uh, so uh, thank you for helping us with that. We have three questions for you this evening. The first question is, why do you think Satan is only bound for 1,000 years instead of being destroyed at the second coming? Let me repeat that. Why do you think Satan is only bound for 1,000 years? instead of being destroyed at the second coming. Question number two. Do you think there will be a literal 1,000-year millennium, and why? Question number two again. Do you think there will be a literal 1,000-year millennium, and why? And the third question. If all believers rule and reign with Christ, where do you think that will be? If all believers rule and reign with Christ, where do you think that will be? 